It's time for the 1430 Connection on 1430 WNAV and 99.9 FM. Spotlighting news, newsmakers, and important community issues. Now, with this week's edition of the 1430 Connection, here is WNAV news anchor Donna Cole. Welcome to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me today is Tuck Hines. He's the director of the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. He's also a principal investigator, a senior scientist. Your expertise is in what? Uh, I'm a marine ecologist, work on fisheries and uh, various aspects of blue crabs and fish and clams and oysters and all kinds of things. Yes, and Kristen Minogue, you are a science writer. You called Tuck the blue crab guy. Blue crab guru. Yes, blue crab guru. And actually, we do need that around these parts, yes? Very much so. Explain to those that have never been there or those that don't know what Cirque is, what is it, Kristen? I like to say that we are the Smithsonian's home for coastal biology. We're located on Chesapeake Bay, but we also do research all over the world. So also in California, Alaska, Panama, Belize, Florida. And we look at the coastal zone. It's where about three-fourths of the world's people live. They're on the front lines of climate change, lots of environmental impacts, and the coasts also support us with fisheries and food and protecting our homes from storms. So they're really, really important systems to preserve. Perfect. And your location, Tuck, is actually on the Road River. Yes, it's a, the Road River is a small embayment of uh, Chesapeake Bay. It's in uh, Edgewater, about uh, five or six miles south of Annapolis. And we have 2,650 acres of land, almost four square miles, and 16 uh, miles of shoreline on, uh, on Chesapeake Bay. So it's a big place. We're a big landowner, and we use that for research and public engagement. It's a jaw-droppingly stunning piece of land, and it is open to the public. Yes, Kristen? So we are open Monday through Saturday, 8.30 till 4.30, only closed on Sundays and federal holidays. So there you go. If you haven't been to it, it's it's so easy to get to in Edgewater, down Route 2 to 214 to right on... Right on Muddy Creek Road. Muddy Creek Road to left, almost within a half a mile into Cirque. Yep. And Cirque is what most people around these parts call it. And right. Now Smithsonian you... Environmental Research Center is a mouthful, so we say Cirque, <laughs> S-E-R-C. Let's talk about your areas of focus at Cirque, Tuck. Sure. Well, uh, as Kristen said, we work on linked ecosystems in the coastal zone. Um, we work on uh, five broad areas of uh, human impacts in the coastal zone that are of interest. Uh, at the top of that is global change, uh, including climate change and things like sea level rise and rising carbon dioxide on uh, effects of pollution, uh, both nutrient pollution, which is a big deal in systems like uh, Chesapeake Bay and other uh, coastal areas, and toxic chemicals, on land use and the effects of uh, human use of the land from development to agriculture and forestry, shoreline development, uh, effects of fishing and overfishing, and then lastly, biodiversity change, which includes uh, especially uh, the problem of invasive species. Um, we're a big center for a study of invasive species. Okay, so let's start with uh, change, climate change, global change. Mm -hmm. uh, you do, as Kristen says, not just research what goes on on the Chesapeake and what goes on on the Road River. You're looking all around the world. We are. We are, uh, do that through a variety of research networks that we uh, instigate and collaborate on. Uh, one is on forests, called Forest Global Earth Observatories. There's 63 sites in 25 countries around the world looking at how forests are changing in response to climate change on a global scale. Second one is called Marine Global Earth Observatories, or Marine Geo, which looks at coastal sites. Uh, and this is a growing network that started in the last five years. We're about at 10 sites now. We expect to eventually get up to around 50 sites. Is the Chesapeake Bay one? And the Chesapeake Bay and the Road River is one of those sites so for, for both uh, Forest Geo and Marine Geo. Let's stop you there. How have you seen, what changes have you seen? How long have you been with, sir? Uh, almost 40 years, a long time. 40, not four. Four, four, zero, four, zero. <laughs> four zeros. Since the mastodons went extinct. Yeah. <laughs> what changes have you seen as that you can attribute to the climate on the Chesapeake Bay? Well, with respect to forests, we can show that uh, the forests in this area, the Baltimore, Washington area, and our, and our research are growing four, two to four times faster in the last 25 or 30 years than in the previous 300 years as a result of climate change. Uh, is that good? Uh, it can be for some species, but it's a, a problem for others. It depends on which species uh, are, are affected and how they're affected and competing. Humans, human species, the forest growing. Is it better for us? There's more oxygen now? Is that what you're saying? 
It is promoting faster growth. And of course, if you're a forester, you like faster growth. Um, and having uh, carbon sequestered in those forests is, is helping to mitigate the effect of rising carbon dioxide okay. from burning of fossil fuels. So that part is generally uh, important and good. Conversely? Um, climate change is having other negative effects, uh, obviously, uh, with rising sea level. And one of the changes that we've seen in Chesapeake Bay is a rise of about eight inches uh, in, the, in uh, Chesapeake Bay sea level rise. And uh, stronger storms, more frequent storms, uh, and changing uh, chemistry of the plants that we grow. The important things that we eat is to get nitrogen and carbon out of uh, the food and the ratio of carbon to nitrogen is important. I saw someone post on their Facebook recently, this isn't going to affect my generation. This might not even affect my kids' generation. What do you say to that? It's already affecting us uh, very much. We've had uh, the hottest year on record. We've had the hottest decade on record. We've seen polar ice caps melt. We've seen the carbon dioxide in the last uh, 50 years has increased more than 20%, over 400 parts per million. The climate has definitely changed, uh, particularly if you're on the western part of the United States, you would not be saying that due to uh, changes in, in uh, droughts and, and uh, the problems of resulting fire. If you were in uh, the Gulf Coast or in Florida, you would be worrying about what the effect of, car of rising carbon dioxide and rising temperature is on uh, storms that we've had uh, this year that are particularly intense. All right, let's take a break with that. Uh, we're going to come right back and talk more about what's going on with CERC. This is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We will be right back. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm in the studio with Tuck Hines. He's the director of the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center right down the road in Edgewater. And Kristen Minoke, she is the science writer for CERC. We were just talking about one of the areas of focus, which there's uh, many uh, going on with the research being done at CERC. And it's not just local, it is global. While we're talking about global change, and this isn't uh, something that I get to see in my backyard, polar bears, I want to... <laughs> I want to go to Churchill, Canada, Manitoba, to see the polar bears. Do you suggest I do that soon? Yes. I mean, obviously, polar bears rely on the ice of the Arctic uh, region, and uh, it's really important uh, for their, as a critical part of their habitat, and the ice is receding and melting at a very fast rate. So um, it's if we continue on track that we're going now, they will have lost uh, much of the ice cap and reduced the habitat available for polar bears. So if you want to see polar bears, particularly uh, in the southern part of their range now, you need to go uh, soon. The Hudson Bay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so moving on to pollution. Uh, actually, go, let's take a step back. The, the effects we've seen in the Chesapeake Bay, you said eight inches we've seen of sea level rise in the Chesapeake Bay in the last... I would say in the last 50 years or so, uh, that's that's been a, an average uh, increase. Uh, in Chesapeake Bay, the other problem, of course, is that the land is subsiding, so that in places like the eastern shore, and, and especially in the southern bay, for Norfolk area, for example, uh, land subsidence uh, and sea level rise combined are really threatening those communities. I did see an article recently about a multi-million dollar gated community where the land values are now nothing in right. the Norfolk area. And uh, here in Annapolis, we're uh, experiencing uh, what we would call, what some people would call nuisance flooding on a pretty frequent basis, oh, yep. uh, m more than 30 times a year. We just had it uh, a week or so ago, and there's a sea level conference going on right now, uh, sea level rise conference uh, dealing with that problem. So the uh, city dock in Annapolis goes underwater pretty frequently, and by uh, 20. Uh, 30, uh, it will be half the days of the year we'll be uh, experiencing at least nu nuisance flooding, if not uh, really serious uh, harmful flooding on storm surges. And we have lost communities in the Chesapeake Bay. We have lost islands in the Chesapeake Bay. We're we have. Yep. In the Rogue River, in fact, we had four islands when I came here, and now we have one and a half islands, mm. uh, in part due to sea level rise and, and uh, erosion of those, of those islands. Let's talk about pollution. We study uh, both the problem of nutrient pollution, the runoff of nitrogen and phosphorus from uh, fertilizers, from agricultural fields is a big problem, and also from developed lands. Uh, we're increasingly dealing with the point source pollution of uh, sewage treatment, uh, but uh, the runoff from people's yards, from fertilizing, and from agriculture continues to be a big problem. 
Uh, the other type of pollution that we look at are toxic chemicals. We're uh, at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center uh, experts on this problem of mercury pollution, toxic mercury, which uh, in this region comes from uh, burning of fossil fuel, coal, uh, that goes up into the air and uh, mercury then rains down on the environment and is processed by microbes in, uh, in uh, wetlands, which then attaches carbon to it and it processes up through the food web. So that's how it gets into humans because we eat those uh, fish at the top end of the food web like uh, big rockfish and tuna and swordfish and, uh, and it's bad for you. It's, uh, there's advisories not to eat too much of that. Full disclosure and this note has been added. I asked the following question in response to an incident that happened to me recently at Jug Bay Wetland Center when I was sprayed with an herbicide by a helicopter. How about things that we're uh, putting on, uh, you know, spraying onto our land to control this, that, and the other, including invasive species? Like, for instance, herbicides which contain glyphosate that we're spraying across everywhere. Uh, to control, go ahead. In that case, I think you're probably referring to Phragmites right. and, and other, uh, it's an herbicide, it kills uh, plants, and if you apply it in a certain way, you can control certain species of plants. Uh, herbicides are broadly used in, in, uh, in ag agriculture to mm -hmm. control weeds or the plants that we don't want to grow in croplands. Um, and uh, that can have negative effects sometimes on when it gets to uh, other plants and other areas where you didn't intend to spray it uh, by either errors or by the wind blowing, for example. There are lots of chemicals that we're using out there to control pests, uh, some intentionally and some uh, inadvertently. The inadvertent things are like uh, mercury that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, the success story, of course, is that were long ago, Rachel Carson uh, recognized the problem of DDT right. and its effect on uh, uh, not just to kill insects, but was causing eggshell thinning in birds. Which so uh, that's been banned, been banned now. And uh, in the last uh, 40 years, uh, birds uh, like uh, eagles and ospreys that are in abundant now back in Chesapeake Bay that were really going very much downhill uh, before the banning of DDT are recovering. So that's a positive story, but we're using lots of other chemicals out there. Is it possible th these other chemicals could be the new DDT? Uh, of course. Um, you know, so there's always an inadvertent, uh, unplanned uh, impacts of, of these chemicals. And so uh, they are very effective at improving some production uh, and control of invasive species or noxious species that we don't want. Uh, remember that we are also controlling things like mosquitoes, which are bringing about all kinds of uh, things like West Nile virus and malaria and, uh, and other things. Mosquitoes get a bad rap and legitimately they should, I, I'm a mosquito magnet, I'm not fond of mosquitoes, but they are important to our ecosystem, are they not? Uh, mosquitoes are eaten by lots of things out there, yes. Okay. Uh, so they're part of the food web and part of the ecosystem, and there are many species of mosquitoes, some of which uh, carry disease and some which don't. But um, mosquitoes on a worldwide basis are one of the major vectors of disease right. uh, impacting humans, so it's uh, nothing to uh, treat lightly. Okay. All right, let's take another short break. This is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We will be right back. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me today is Tuck Hines. He's the director of the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. He's a senior scientist, a principal investigator, His and Kristen Minoke. She's the science writer. She's, she's really cool. You need to go on the website and read some of the stuff she's written because it's amazing. One of those things is about uh, sharks and ray tagging, which, uh, you know, I did not know we're doing right here in the Bay. Yes, we are. So our um, Fish and Invertebrate Ecology Lab, which is the lab that Tuck helps run, is doing a lot of blue crab research, but also doing research on cow nose rays and sharks. And they have a program where they can look for four different species of sharks that come around the bay, and they will put a small acoustic tag inside the shark. It's completely safe. The shark often doesn't really know it's there. They put them in the water, and then these tags not little pings. And there are receivers all on the Atlantic coast that can then pick up these pings. And by that, we can track where these sharks are located. It's so cool. You can't go, okay, for us, the public that wants to see this in real time, it's not, you can't, but you can see this online. Uh, yes. 
Yes, we have a website uh, that shows some of the tracks of these uh, tags, and uh, we're learning uh, over the last three years some very interesting things about m migratory movement of these sharks and rays uh, in and out of Chesapeake Bay and along the east coast of North America. And regarding the cow nose rays, which were many years not understood and fished galore, we are learning how they live. Yep, for example, the cow nose rays come up into Chesapeake Bay and other uh, estuaries of the, of the coast in the summertime to birth their young, uh, live birth, uh, called pups. Uh, ray, these rays give off one uh, birth one pup a year, so low birth rate, and it means they can be overfished. But they migrate to Florida every winter. Uh, and so we've tracked them now for three uh, winters. This will be a, a fourth winter coming up, going down to Florida, down in the Cape Canaveral area and into the Indian River. How cool Lagoon, is that? And then back. And they, the, the rays that come into Chesapeake Bay always come back to Chesapeake Bay, and the other rays come up to other estuaries, return to those estuaries uh, as well. That's so cool. So it's, um, it's kind, of, kind of interesting. And what kind of sharks do we have in the bay? Well, there are a lot of species of sharks uh, in in the um, all along the coast here. We have uh, bull sharks, uh, black tip shark, dusky sharks, um, many different species of sharks here, and that we're tracking. And these areas of these bays and uh, and lagoons, um, like the lagoonal system up North Carolina and the coastal bays and Chesapeake Bay and Delaware Bay, serve as important feeding and and uh, nursery habitats for these for these sharks. Many sharks eat shellfish. They're not just uh, eating fish or, um, or, or, or prey like that. So it's a, a complicated uh, food web that we're beginning to understand and how they're moving. What can people do like me that want to, that are just intrigued by all this? The people that grew up on Jacques Cousteau. You did not grow up on Jacques Cousteau, <laughs> did you? <laughs> no, but I've heard John Denver and Calypso. That's about as far as I've gotten. Into <laughs> I had generation. to watch it. I had to watch it every week. You took. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So the people that want to learn more about what's going on at CERC, we can actually work down there as volunteers. Yes, you can. So there are lots of opportunities for the public to come down and see what CERC does. Um, probably the easiest one is just come and visit us. We are open from 8.30 until 4.30 on Monday through Saturday, and we have trails that can be hiked. They're gorgeous any time of year. Um, lots if you of want, birds. We Talk have lots of birds, okay. lots of birds too. Yeah. And if you want to go more in depth, we also have a lecture series that we do. We have experts come in from Cirque, the Smithsonian, and outside to talk about bay issues. And we also have opportunities for citizen scientists if you want to volunteer. So for example, one project we have is our archaeology lab. A lot of our land was once tobacco plantations. And so we are digging into the area around there, seeing what kind of artifacts we can find and seeing like, how did people use the land 200, 300 years ago? And those people that are doing that are all volunteers. They Tell are. me some of the things they've found. A lot of it is animal bones. So they're looking at seeing like, what did people eat back then? Mm -hmm. There was occasionally some thought that, well, they're in the new world. They should be eating deer. They should be hunting. That wasn't actually the case. They were eating a lot of pork and a lot of beef. They were bringing animals from Europe down to here uh -huh. and cultivating them for those that love working with children? Yes, we have one education specialist who coordinates everything, and then a lot of our field trips are run by volunteers who help her out. More information on CERC is available where? On our website, you can go to www.serc.si.edu. Okay. Tuck, what have I missed? What's something really cool that you're working on now that you might be working on in the future that we don't know about yet? Well, we're just beginning some of these shark studies, so those are, uh, you know, will be interesting and stay tuned for that. The uh, programs that we have in forest ecology, I haven't talked about forests and how important they are, are all run by citizen science. So tracking and ta tagging, marking those trees so they don't move the way the sharks do, but they grow and they, uh, and they uh, often will die in storms and things like that. So we're, we're watching uh, how those forest communities are responding to climate change. The shark tagging, is that any volunteers right? Required? Uh, no, that that is uh, not so much for the tagging of them, but we are using citizens to help uh, analyze the data for both fish research and uh, shark research. Okay, so this goes back to my uh, Jacques Cousteau. I would just have this image of me donning a, a scuba suit and you know chasing down a shark, but that's you won't be using no, volunteers we're using for that. More technology okay. than, uh, that, <laughs> than right. that with this uh, ultrasonic telemetry. Kristen, you wanted to add something? Yeah, so for volunteers who do like marine biology, yeah. every year later in the spring and summer, we do have something called a zombie crab project, our Chesapeake Bay Parasite Project. 
it has volunteers come to our docks and they're looking for these really tiny mud crabs to see if they're infected by a parasite that is infecting mud crabs across the bay. Well, so now that sounds cool. If you want to get in the water when it's warmer out, you are welcome to join us. No scuba suit required. Nope. Okay, that sounds right up my alley. All right, talk what else? Kristen mentioned the archaeology associated with uh, colonial times, but we also do archaeology of the Indian shell middens, the oyster shell middens. We're doing a big project uh, on uh, how uh, oysters can be restored in, in Chesapeake Bay, uh, on wetland ecology uh, that people can participate in as well. And uh, we have a stream restoration project that's uh, involved uh, at, at CERC. I can't thank you both enough for being here today. Thank you very much. It's great to talk with you. Thank you for having us. This is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We will see you next week.